It's now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. Uh, earlier this week, the Premier and his MPPs, uh, against all science and health advice, voted against our motion to reopen outdoor amenities, uh, amenities sa safely. So can the Premier confirm that he is now going to uh, go back uh, on, his, uh, on his decision, lift the restrictions that he imposed on outdoor activities, notwithstanding the fact that every credible expert begged him not to do so? Order. To reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, I would say to the Leader of the Official Opposition that we have encouraged people to be outdoors. The weather is great now. We encourage people to be outdoors, go to the parks. The parks are all open. Go for a walk, go for a bike ride, go for a run, get outside and get some exercise. We know that's important for people's physical and mental well-being. So we have not strayed from that. We have always encouraged people to be outdoors this time of year. Supplementary question. The, uh, back to the Premier. This government has a terrible record on reopening. We will remember back in the fall, they brought forward their color-coded framework uh, in which the metrics that they utilized were four times higher than what the experts recommended. Back in February, the science table predicted that if the government rushed the reopening and didn't put in place extra uh, public health precautions, that we would be in a very terrible situation. They predicted disaster, and lo and behold, the Premier ignored their advice and walked us right into this brutal third wave. In April, the Premier decided to close playgrounds and bring a, a, a police state into Ontario instead of giving us paid sick days for our essential workers. That's not what the science tables recommended. And now, apparently, there's been another marathon cabinet battle underway. Will this Premier commit this time to not rely on buddies and lobbyists and stakeholders in his decision-making, but actually listen to the science? Order. Minister Health, good point. Speaker, well, since the beginning of this pandemic, our government's top priority has been the health and well-being of the people of Ontario. And since the arrival of the more transmissible variants to the province, which was actually what did lead to the third wave, we've continued to take the necessary actions to control the spread. But we continue to rely on the, the advice and recommendations of our Chief Medical Officer of Health, our Public Health Measures Table, and many other medical experts to review the science and the data and the clinical evidence to provide us with advice and recommendations on when we can safely start to reopen the province, when the time is right. Because there are many factors that need to be considered, including the, uh, the numbers of the, uh, the cases that we're seeing in the province, what's happening with hospitalizations, new hospitalizations, as well as ICU rates, the R rate, uh, public health system capacity, and of course, the rate of vaccinations, which are going extremely well. We've now vaccinated over 7.5 million wow. people in the province of Ontario. That's very good news. Final supplementary. The problem is they don't take the experts' advice. They don't take the advice. We cannot get this wrong again. It is important to get it right. Parents want their kids back in schools. Working people want to be safely back on the job. Frontline health care workers need relief, not a fourth wave to deal with. Businesses need certainty so that they can reopen for good and start hiring people again. Everybody wants to see public health ahead of politics. Speaker, the Premier has messed it up three times, costing us jobs, costing lives, costing businesses. We don't trust him. Nobody trusts this government to get it right. So will he commit today to, to base his, his plan on the expert advice? Make sure that he makes that advice public because nobody trusts this Premier. Nobody has confidence Question. that he'll get it right this time. To reply, the Minister of Health. Okay, well, I would say, of course, we are relying on the medical advice and the scientific advice that we're receiving from the experts. They will be the ones that will advise us when 
It will be safe to start gradually reopening things. We know that has to be done on a very gradual basis because of the variants of concern in particular. And that more information will be coming forward on that very, very, very soon. The next question. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks very much. My next question is also to the Premier. Um, I have to say that people are relieved that uh, the announcement came that the surgeries are going to start being uh, booked again. And that, is, uh, that is really great, and it can't happen uh, soon enough, as we all know. Uh, in fact, in the National Post, uh, uh, there was a report that uh, said this, a soon-to-be-published data, and I quote, uh, indicates that twice as many Ontarians with heart ailments passed away waiting for surgery during the pandemic than before COVID-19 hit. So my question to the Premier is, can he, can he tell us uh, how long he expects uh, people to have to wait and how many Ontarians have already passed away while waiting for their surgeries? Minister Health. Speaker, well, our government is certainly well aware that many people are very anxious, wanting to have uh, their surgeries that have been postponed uh, done as soon as possible, and to have the diagnostic procedures done as well. We know that there are many people that have had their lives uh, put on hold for a period of time because of the variants, because of the surging cases that we've seen that have required hospitalization of many, many people with the COVID uh, variants. However, we have already put significant amounts of money into dealing with the backlog, $500 million from last fall to the most recent budget. $500 million will certainly help, but I think it's also important to note that in 2020-2021, the average Ontario hospital completed 88% of their total surgical allocation, and that since the beginning of this pandemic, there have been already over 430,000 scheduled surgeries done, and more to be done now with the uh, reissuance of the uh, amendment to uh, Directive Number 2. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, with all due respect, people haven't only had to put their lives uh, on hold, people have lost their lives while they've been on hold. The FAO estimates, as everybody, estimates, as everybody knows, uh, that there will be 419,000 surgeries and procedures uh, backlogged by September, and it'll take three and a half years to clear that backlog. Uh, it didn't have to be this way. In British Columbia, they started uh, last summer to try to reduce the backlog and get those surgeries and procedures dealt with, and they entered the third wave of this pandemic with 95% of their backlog cleared. That Order. didn't happen in Ontario. Uh, Ontario did nothing in that regard, and now we're further behind than ever, Speaker. And even worse, this government tabled a budget that had less than half of the necessary funding to clear the backlog. So my question is, when will we see a plan that has clear question. benchmarks and the appropriate funding to clear the surgical and procedural backlog? Minister Hill. Speaker, well, the situation in BC can't be compared to the situation in Ontario because it's important to point out that the percentage of procedures uh -huh. completed in BC represents the patients who were on surgical wait lists when the ramp down in March 2020 began and had their surgeries delayed. It does not account for patients that would have been added to wait lists in that time period if there had not been a ramp down. So that is not even applicable to Ontario. But with respect to what is happening in Ontario, we have invested over $283 million to support additional priority surgeries, including cardiac, cancer, orthopedic and cataract surgeries. We've extended diagnostic imaging hours at healthcare facilities for MRIs, CT scans and other tests. We've invested more than $351 million for more than 2,250 new beds at 57 hospitals. We've also initiated a surgical waitlist and surgical smoothing program to make sure that we can help people as quickly as possible and we have invested the money in, able to, in order to be able to do that. In the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, people are suffering, and they can't wait indefinitely for this government to put a plan together. Uh, Dr. Harindra uh, Wijaysindra, uh, a Sunnybrook cardiologist, says this, and I quote, I have lost a lot of patients on the wait list. Those patients and their families deserve recognition that they are victims of this pandemic, too. Patients are literally losing their lives while waiting for delayed surgeries. 
Speaker, my question to the Premier is this. Without significant investment and a serious plan to eliminate the backlog, patients desperate for surgery are going to be left suffering and at increasing risk. When will we see the plan and the funding? Well, there is a plan and there is the funding, of, as I've just indicated to you, $500 million to start in order to be able to move forward with the diagnostic procedures as well as the surgeries. This has been organized for some time. We've been working through it. We were able to do many of the surgeries and procedures uh, before the third wave hit us, and we are looking to do that as, as much as we can now. This is something that Dr. Williams and uh, the medical experts, as well as people in our government, have been looking at the list on a daily basis to see when we can amend Directive Number 2. You're right. It's great that it's happened. We'll be able to start with the ambulatory procedures and day procedures as soon as, as now in some hospitals, as long as they're able to follow the guidelines and rules set out by Ontario Health. That is very good news, and we know that people are anxious to have their surgeries done or procedures done, and we are going to move through them as quickly as possible. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Um, speaker, this morning, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives released a new report that calls on this government to commit to ending private, for-profit long-term care in Ontario. The report notes that the main focus for private long-term care operators is making a profit for themselves and their shareholders, and they're willing to cut corners if that means bigger profits for them. We've seen this clearly throughout the pandemic with many homes withholding PPE and not paying their PSWs and frontline workers a livable wage. Speaker, the main focus of anyone in seniors' care should be making sure seniors are safe and healthy. But that's not what's happening here in Ontario. And that's why the COVID-19 death rate in for-profit homes was twice the rate of non-profit homes and five times the rate of publicly owned homes, Speaker. My question through you to the Premier is, will the Conservatives let this report and recommendations sit on the shelf yet again, like all the other advice they've been given, or will they take responsibility, take action, and take the profit out of long-term care? To apply, the government has uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we uh, started taking action uh, uh, from day one when we were elected, Mr. Speaker. We didn't. Uh, uh, need reports uh, to tell us that we needed to make uh, some significant investments into long-term care. That is why, of course, we started immediately back in 2018 to build long-term care beds. Look, I've said on a number of occasions, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, the fact that the previous uh, Liberal administration only built some uh, 600 beds uh, over, over the time that they were in office is completely unacceptable. There were four previous Liberal administrations that did nothing to build out long-term care, did nothing to refurbish uh, some of the older homes, did nothing for staff strategy. Look, what we're doing is putting 2,000 new nurses uh, in, in stream, 27,000 new uh, PSWs, 30,000 additional spaces, Mr. Speaker. This is an incredible step uh, on, on, our, on our way to ensuring that every, pay, every uh, resident of long-term care gets four hours of care, a North American uh, uh, level of, uh, of care, leading level of care, Mr. Speaker. We're well on our way to the best system in, uh, in North America, and I hope the members opposite will support us on that. A supplementary question. Speaker, it's not just New Democrats and everyday Ontarians who are calling for an end to for-profit, big corporate long-term care, a, a clear legacy of, of the Liberal government and Conservative government as well. It's senators, it's lawyers, it's public health and policy experts, economists, just to name a few, Speaker. They all agree that phasing out for-profit long-term care isn't just the right thing to do, it's essential to the well-being of our seniors and the health of our long-term care system here in Ontario. Again, to the Premier, will you take the advice of these experts, listen to them and the data, and commit to taking the profit out of long-term care? Yeah. Out, uh, well, certainly, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to take the advice of the members opposite who are suggesting that we remove thousands of beds from uh, from uh, the system, Mr. Speaker. That's just not simply not going to happen. I'm not certain what the members opposite don't understand. We're not going to reduce the amount of long-term care available to the people of the province of Ontario like the member is suggesting. We're going to increase Order. about 30,000 spaces, Mr. Speaker, because we know 
We need to. We're not going to reduce the amount of care in long-term care homes. We're going to increase it, Mr. Speaker. Four hours of care, Order. which uh, is why we're hiring some 27,000 additional PSWs, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're bringing on 2,000 additional nurses. So, very clearly to the member opposite, no, I am not going to listen to you. I'm not going to reduce the amount of long-term care beds. I'm not going to reduce the amount of nurses. I'm not going to reduce the amount of PSWs. I'm not going to reduce Response. the amount of care. I'm going to do just the opposite, as all of the members on this side of the House are committed to doing. We're going to get this right, Mr. Speaker, because it's been too long and it's been ignored for too long. <laughs> The official opposition will come to order. The next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a major priority for our Premier, for our Health Minister, for this government has been getting needles into arms. As of today, as the Minister just mentioned, over seven and a half million Ontario adults have received their first dose. Ensuring that millions of people can get their vaccine is simply no small feat. This government has worked diligently to create a robust online platform and call centre to manage the demand for vaccines. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services provide some insight into the work that has gone on behind the scenes to enable more than 7.5 million Ontarians receive a vaccine? To reply, the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member, the hardworking member from Flamborough Glanbrook, for that important question. Because I would like to share in the House that I routinely refer to the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services as the machinery of government. And they have not failed us when it comes to making appointments for vaccine bookings. And you know, when you couple our effective call center with the online booking that was stood up by the Ministry of Health, we have an amazing one-two punch when it comes to accessing vaccines. For example, just two weeks ago on May 3rd, when the 18 and older cohort in hotspot regions were allowed to start making their appointments, we had a record-breaking day. At that time, we accommodated through the online call or the online portal and our call centre, 420,000 appointments. Response. And the very next day, we also accommodated almost 300,000 appointments uh, again. So what I would like to share with everyone in the House, when you pull our call centre together with our online booking, we have one of the best systems in North America. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And uh, I know Ontarians are reassured to hear that our call centre is here to help all of those who are eligible and want a vaccine to actually get one. And Mr. Speaker, our call center offers support in over 300 languages. And Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure if you know this, but Ontario is among the first, if not the first jurisdiction to offer live translation services for vaccine book. Yes, here, that's here. correct. Yes, the, the first. With the tremendous interest and volume our call centres have experienced, there have also been key days when wait times cannot be avoided. Can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services shed some light on what patterns that she is seeing and what Ontarians can expect when they call for support? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much. And you know, I'm very proud to share with everyone that when you take into consideration our, our unique live real time translation in 300 languages, when you think about the hundreds of agents that we have available to book appointments through our call centre, and when you also marry that with our effective online portal, we are one of the best in North America when it comes to booking vaccines. And I have to tell you that while there sometimes is a wait time. That's good news because it shows that there's are hundreds of thousands of people that want to help Ontario move forward by getting their vaccines. And you know, Speaker, I, I'm really pleased to share with you that the average time in booking an appointment is less than seven minutes. You know, just uh, earlier this week, my mom sent me a note on Monday. She got notification from the Huron-Perth Health Unit that she could book her second appointment. Response. I also heard from an individual that had 22,999 people ahead of him on Tuesday morning that he booked his appointment for Sunday. Speaker, we have one of the best appointment booking systems in North America, and thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. 
Students and their families are worn down. After another five weeks, and in some cases even longer, of emergency remote learning, they are missing their friends, their teachers. And they're watching very anxiously as the end of the year approaches and there's a possibility that they're going to have another Zoom chat replace their graduations. Speaker, this government refused to do what was necessary to keep schools safely open because they just didn't want to spend the money. They refused to listen to the experts when they closed the playgrounds and the soccer fields. We don't even know at this moment how many education workers have been vaccinated, which is a key part of reopening schools. Speaker, is the Premier going to come forward with any kind of plan to salvage this school year, or is the real plan to keep kids in online learning permanently? Minister of Education, to respond. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to follow the best expert advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, as we have done throughout the pandemic. I know the members opposite did not vote for uh, his continuation, give confidence to our lead medical officer, but on this side of the House, we believe in following his advice, and that's why we have done so since the beginning. It's why Ontario has one of the lowest rates, case rates, for children under the age of 20 in the nation, because we invested $1.6 billion, put every in, uh, uh, you know, every uh, intervention possible within our schools from improving air ventilation to the supplying of three quality mass PPE uh, to cohorting students to increase screening, asymptomatic testing, the only province that has that type of capacity within all regions of the province. We've done that following the advice. We're going to continue to do that. Obviously, we know how important it is to keep schools open. While we have done so uh, throughout the year, our aim is to is follow the advice Spons? of the Chief Medical Officer because we do not want to put at risk the recovery that we now finally see on the horizon. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Speaker, what's clear, I think, from a response like that is that this government is wiping its hands of this school year and of our students across this province. This Premier isn't serious about safely reopening schools because he's too focused on saving money by keeping our kids permanently online. That is their plan. They've made it very clear. Teachers, education workers, school boards, pediatricians, Order. parents, mental health advocates, they are all saying the same thing. Online learning is harming our kids. We should be investing now in reopening our schools. The Public School Boards Association has said the government's plan, and I want to quote this, Mr. Speaker, may be promoting the online learning option to the detriment of student well-being and the overall integrity of our education system. Why, with the mounting evidence and growing backlash, why Question. won't this government drop this terrible plan? Minister of Education. It is ironic, Speaker, coming from members opposite who've stood with the teacher unions to keep schools closed throughout 2021. In fact, it was the members opposite who said schools should remain closed so long as the state home order, order remains in place. They would have kept schools closed, they would have taken away choice from parents, and they would have undermined order. the learning quality kids in this province deserve. The Premier provided $1.6 billion, more than any province, more than the Democrats in, in British Columbia, more funding for mental health than any province, 400 per cent increase than when the former Liberals were in power. Power. We have followed the advice. We've put in place for Davenport, come to asymptomatic order. testing, stricter screening of kids. We have ensured busing, transportation has been improved. We have ensured cleaning is enhanced within our schools. We did all that, leading us to one of the lowest rates of case cases for you. Let the minister complete his answer. We have put in those dollars in place that has led us to one of the lowest case rates of youth under 20 in Canada because we followed the advice. We want to keep schools open. We want kids in school. It must be safe. We are following the best advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, as we have done throughout this pandemic, and Response? we will continue to do so in the interest of sure, students sure. in Ontario. Sure. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On November 3rd of last year, the Premier released a color-coded reopening plan that was immediately rejected by scientists and public health experts. On February 11th, the Premier was advised that if he reopened too early, we would ha have a disaster. Well, the Premier reopened too early and we had a catastrophic third wave. On April 16th, the Premier brought in carting enclosed playgrounds. Scientists immediately said this is not what we are recommending. So, Speaker, will the Premier commit today to a reopening plan supported by the science advisory table with clear and transparent 
key indicators for when it is safe to reopen schools, communities, and businesses for outdoor and indoor service. Minister of Health. Speaker, well, first let me be clear. It's the arrival of the more transmissible variants that actually led to the third wave that we're dealing with, with the higher rates, and that is why we've been calling on the federal government Order. to do something about that, because that is how the variants came in. However, since we have implemented the stay-at-home order, order, we're also looking at how we may safely exit it when the time is right, because you're absolutely right. We need to do this slowly and carefully, and there needs to be a plan which is being developed, which is based on the scientific advice and medical advice that we've received from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, the public health table, as well as other medical experts. And it is based on looking at um, outdoors activities first, indoors activity later, but there will be more information that will be coming forward with respect to this imminently. Here, here. Supplementary. Speaker, with all due respect to the minister, and I have the utmost respect for this minister, the government has not followed the advice of the science advisory table time and time again. <laughs> Speaker, this is a matter of public confidence and trust. The only way we are going to combat COVID and get this pandemic behind us is minister, if the, the environment come to order. Public if the public is on side. So I am pleading with the government today, Speaker, follow the advice of the science advisory table, have clear indicators, be transparent with the people of Ontario, what the science advisory table is telling them, and give businesses time to plan. No more flip-flopping. Will the government Question. commit to doing that today, Speaker? Mr. Bell. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate the question from the member, and I can certainly advise the, the member opposite that we are relying on the medical advice that we're receiving from the science advisory table. That's one group, the public health measures table, the chief medical officer advice, and other medical experts. They are certainly providing us with guidance on when and how things can be opened when the time is right, because there are many factors, of course, that need to be considered. The rates of vaccination, which are going very well with over 7.5 million vaccines already administered, but it's also dealing with the numbers of new hospitalizations, the numbers of people who are in intensive care units, the R rate, the public health system capacity. There are a variety of factors that must be considered, but I can certainly assure the member through you, Mr. Speaker, that we are listening to the medical experts. We are following following their clinical Response. advice and, and recommendations, that there will be a plan that which will be released imminently. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. As we head into the second summer of this pandemic, all of the members in this chamber have seen and heard how hard the effects of COVID-19 have been on Ontario's small businesses. We also know how the recovery of these small businesses is critical to the recovery of our communities as we lay the groundwork to rebuild Ontario better in the work of this wake of this pandemic. That's why, Mr. Speaker, I was happy to hear from a number of small businesses in my community who were in dire need of financial support that they received the second installment of the Ontario Small Business Support Grant. Could the minister tell us more about how the government is supporting Ontario small businesses at this time and elaborate on what new supports have been made available to small businesses? Member for Willowdale and Parliamentary Assistant Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member. I know he cares deeply about the small businesses who, who have been impacted greatly by COVID-19. And our government has been working with those businesses for the last 14 months, from the beginning of this pandemic, uh, providing over $23 billion to protect our jobs and our economy. In our most recent budget, 2021, our government set aside $100 million for Ontario Tourism and Travel Small Business Support Grant to help the tourism industry reclaim its place as an economic powerhouse job creator in our province. Applications are now open for the Ontario Tourism and Travel Small Business Support Grant, which will provide one-time payments of $10,000 to $20,000 to eligible small businesses in the tourism and travel sector. Each small business owner can use that, that money to support whatever they feel is best, whether that is paying wages, keeping the doors open. Uh, again, business owners understand their needs best, Speaker. So I encourage everyone to visit Ontario.ca slash COVID support uh, for further eligibility details. Please apply. I think all members in this House have a responsibility 
ability to help those Fonts. businesses apply, and that deadline will be open until June 21st, 2021. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the parliamentary assistant for that uh, answer. It's great news that the government is supporting hard-hit small businesses in so many ways. As the minister knows, some of the hardest-hit small businesses in this pandemic are in Ontario's vital tourism sector. Specifically in my riding, we've had 33 years of summer music fest that is in jeopardy of not going on. The revenue that that generates for our community, the, the spill-off in tourism, is absolutely fantastic. Could the minister please tell us how the Ontario Tourism and Travel Small Business Support Grant fits into the government's plan to rebuild a healthy economy? Willowdale. Thank you very much, Speaker. And it's an important question. I would like to correct my record. That uh, grant uh, application program will be open until June 25, 2021. Just misspoke there. Uh, and our government's going to continue to do our best to support this hearted sector. Uh, we've been doing that from the beginning. The, the Minister of Tourism and Culture, uh, Sport, Heritage Industries has hosted 15 town halls since the start of this pandemic, uh, advocated for the industry at the Jobs and Recovery Committee, uh, created 14 ministerial advisory committees, and created the Tourism Task Force. And on Thursday, May 13th, the Minister uh, announced the Ontario Tourism and Travel Small Business Grant Program and hosted three briefings throughout the day. Uh, one was for the stakeholders in the tourism and travel industry, where close to a thousand stakeholders were invited and speaker hundreds showed up, one for the government MPPs and one for the opposition. And to the two members who actually showed up for that town hall, I want to thank you for putting politic, politics below Order. your constituents, that your Response. constituents are more important. And on a personal note, I want to thank you uh, and let you know that I have deep respect for you in this chamber. Thank you again for supporting small businesses, Speaker. Our government is continue to do that. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. The hardworking personal support workers in this province are exploited, underpaid, and overworked. Many of these workers are immigrant and racialized women, and for over a year they have worked on the front lines of this pandemic, putting their lives at risk to care for the seniors of this province. I recently spoke with Connie, a PSW in my riding in Toronto Centre. She's worked throughout the pandemic caring for seniors in their homes. Her hours fluctuate significantly, and she doesn't have benefits. And while she receives pandemic pay, it only applies to the time she is scheduled to care for residents, which sometimes can be as little as three hours a day. PSW pandemic pay wage enhancements are set to expire at the end of June. Connie and other PSWs across the province are demanding a permanent pay raise speaker. Will this government listen and give personal support workers the pay increase and full-time jobs that they deserve? And to reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. We certainly also value the incredible work that personal support workers have done throughout this pandemic. They've been there in our long-term care homes, in our hospitals, in home and community care. We know that there, uh, there are issues relating to their wages. That's why we have provided this temporary support that's running to the end of June. But during that time, we're also looking at some of the issues, other issues, that personal support workers are concerned about. Not having full-time jobs in some situations, not having benefits, not having uh, being paid for some of the additional work they do, the traveling time, all of the other issues that they're concerned about. We want PSWs to stay in the system. We know that many leave after their first year because it's not the job that they expected it to be. So we want to work that into their training and education as well. So in short, there are many many issues that need to be dealt with to uh, keep our personal support Spons. workers and retain them in our system, and we are working on just that in addition to the, the pay requirements. Question. Thank you. And respectfully back to the minister, if you want to keep PSWs in our system and keep them in your jobs, the answer is simple. You need to just pay them more and give them permanent full-time work. Speaker. PSWs are essential and they deserve to be treated with respect. Connie, the PSW working in my riding, told me that the, the seniors that she visits depend on her. She is paid for only one hour each visit to provide the most basic of care, like helping them go to the washroom, bathing them, preparing food. It is impossible to rush this kind of care in an hour. Ultimately, she ends up volunteering her time because she can't stand to leave these seniors without the help that they need. Our seniors deserve the highest quality care, and the workers who care for them deserve a decent, livable wage and full-time careers. When is this government going to step up and do the right thing and properly pay PSWs in the province of Ontario? Mr. Health. 
Yeah, the question that the member asked you, she indicated, Speaker, uh, through you to the member, that there are other issues in addition to the pay issue. There's the timing issue, there's the travelling issue, there's the trying to put people, to groups of people together so that there's not huge travel time involved in it, and making sure that people are paid for the work that they do and that they don't have to volunteer. But we also know that there's other issues. We're looking at uh, the bill that's just been put forward in the legislature to, uh, to regulate personal health workers to make sure that they have certain standards that they need to conform to. They want that. We are doing that because we also recognize that's important for them, but it's also important for the very vulnerable people that personal support workers care for. Children, seniors, people with disabilities. We are looking at all of these issues to make sure that when someone goes through and, and is trained as a personal support worker, that they want to stay, Response. that they want to continue to do this work. They are really the linchpins in home care. I certainly would agree with the member. They are the ones that know the family. They know all the issues related to what's going on. So we want to encourage them. We want them to stay in this group. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, last night we had an incredibly important conversation in this House on making the education system more equitable through Bill 287. Few members were here. I want to thank my colleagues of the opposition who share their important and moving personal stories and Oswell for their constructive feedback. It was extremely disappointing that the government came to the debate with their minds made up believing that they are already doing enough to fight racism in the education system. It is unacceptable to refer to any action on systemic discrimination as counterproductive. There can never be enough done as long as systemic barriers still exist. So to the minister, why won't the government work with all members of this House to implement Bill 287 when it has the potential to improve the education system even further? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are very much committed to breaking down barriers that impede the success of students, particularly racialized, indigenous, and underrepresented uh, young people in the province of Ontario. Respectfully, the former Liberal government had 15 years to advance equity in education, and they did not. And today, they bring forth a private member's bill, Order. Um, whereas this government, since day one, has brought forth transformation. I mean, we are the government, unlike the former Liberals, respectfully, that are de-streaming the grade 9 math curriculum. We are following the best advice by limiting discretionary suspensions of young kids, disproportionately impacting black racialized children and special education children. We are the government that mandated professional development on all elected trustees, public and Catholic, English and French, all school board administrators when it comes to human rights training. And we're the government that ensured that students see themselves reflected in their educators by abolishing a regulation that removed the ability of principals Spons? to hire based on equity, on diversity and on merit in Ontario. Supplementary question, the member for Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, growing up in Orleans, uh, my community wasn't the most diverse place. Uh, in a high school of 1,600 students, I can count on maybe two hands uh, the families of uh, children who come from non-white uh, backgrounds. But we didn't talk about it. It wasn't something that was discussed in school. We didn't talk about it as friends, and, and as a result, that lack of understanding, that lack of vocabulary to talk about these issues remains with me uh, to this day, Mr. Speaker. We need to ensure that our children are exposed to, the, to more understanding of where we are as a society today and how we got here. And sometimes understanding that history is going to be difficult, it's going to be hard, and it's going to be uncomfortable. But it's important to do, Mr. Speaker, and if we don't do it, we're leading our children to a great disservice. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll ask the Minister of Education again. Why won't his government support Bill 287 and ensure that our children get the understanding, education, and conversation they need and they deserve? Mr. Education. If the member opposite's uh, you know, uh, thesis to the House is that we need to better reflect society and diversity, then how could the member opposite be part of a party, be associated with a political party that allowed hiring of educators in Ontario singularly on their seniority, not based on their eth ethno-cultural backgrounds. So we can have, for example, in Peel Region, Order. where I had to call the first time in Canadian history that a government called in a supervisor Remember for the for Ottawa purpose South of racism. Come to order. That did not happen under your watch, respectfully, and you had the chance to take action, Peel, and you failed them. We acted because we believe 
we have to fight di uh, discrimination in all of its forms. If we believe in the principle of making sure that the people that inspire our kids reflect the communities um, that our schools are in, then we should be supporting efforts like the elimination of Regulation 274 that ensures the best Fox. candidate, diverse candidates, are the ones who lead instruction in our yeah, classrooms. Yeah. That is just good government. We're going to continue following. Next question. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, and my leader of the opposition will come to order. Member for Peterborough, sorry, Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Speaker. I apologize. It was just an urgent uh, email from a constituent, and I apologize. I've offended the leader opposite. Um, Speaker, we know that, uh, that, that during these difficult times, a permeable border is a order. danger when it comes to the spread of the dangerous COVID-19 uh, variants. These, uh, these variants of concern are real, and they have entered Ontario. Speaker, this government's made additional investments to contact tracing, additional investments to our hospital, additional investments uh, to support with IPAC measures, additional investments uh, to support in our schools. We continue this very real fight against COVID-19 so that we can put it beyond us and get back our lives. Our cousin nations around the world, in part of their COVID-19 response, have implemented strict border measures. I recently learned that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom has come under fire for not restricting travel from the United uh, travel to the United Kingdom from international hotspots sooner. So, can the Solicitor General please update the House on any lessons learned from the UK experience and what more would be relevant? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. He's absolutely right. Dangerous COVID variants came to Ontario from outside our borders. The B117 variant was first identified in the UK. The B1351 variant first identified in South Africa. The B1 from Brazil and the B1617 was first identified in India. These variants are still active in our communities and more of them can appear in the future if the federal government refuses to act quickly. We don't want dangerous variants to run rampant in Ontario and create a fourth wave. That is why we want to ensure that the federal government does their job, locks down the borders, protects our communities, and makes sure that we aren't facing a fourth wave because of these variants of concern. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And my supplemental uh, back to the minister. Um, I know that vaccines play an important role in, uh, in stopping the spread, an important role in returning uh, to our lives back uh, to normal. We continue to set daily records in the number of vaccines administered and doses in arms. Given the great success of our vaccine uh, campaign to date, no one wants to see that effort go to waste uh, due to emergent variants uh, that slip through our borders. All everyone wants is a safe and normal summer, Mr. Speaker. I think to the many activities I look forward to hopefully getting back to in my riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South. And we know Ontarians have done their part in helping stop the spread of COVID-19, and they expect their government to do the same. So my question back to the Solicitor General. Are there concrete examples of how Ontarians have reduced their mobility during this pandemic and what more we can do to help stop the spread of COVID-19? Thank you, Speaker. General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Peterborough, Northumberland, no, Northumberland, Peterborough South. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that we are engaging in this, in this conversation because people need to understand that what they have been doing is making a difference. For example, Highway 401 between the 400 and Keel Street, which remains an important arter artery for supply chain, has nonetheless seen traffic decrease by 25% when compared to pre-pandemic levels. Given the sacrifices that Ontarians have made over many, many months, it's time for the federal government to match that effort with action of their own. After all, we're all in this together, and we need to cooperate. Unfortunately, thus far, our plea to protect Ontarians continues to be ignored by the federal government. It is deeply disturbing to see how many pathways people are coming in and the carrying the variants of concern while we are dealing with high ICU rates and hospitalization rates. The federal government needs to act now. The next question, the member for London, Fanshawe. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Community and Social Services. On behalf of my constituents, I put forward a series of questions to the Ministry of Children and Community and Social Services, and we asked specific questions about whether there would be an appeals process, what the success markers of a pilot program, whether clinicians would get the final say, or whether it would be a care coordinator who have no clinical experience, expertise, what criteria the ministry used to determine invitations to the pilot OAP program, very specific questions, you see, Speaker. So, of course, these families feel like it was a slap in the face when the ministry essentially copy and pasted the same non-answer in response. Will this government commit to transparency to these families and finally answer these, que these questions? To reply, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'm really proud of the job that our government has been doing on the new Ontario Autism Program and all the work that's been put into it by our volunteer clinicians and researchers and uh, community advocates and, and those with uh, lived experience, Mr. Speaker, over the last uh, year. Uh, the work on that Ontario Autism Program is well underway, and I'm really pleased to say that the first 600 children have uh, been accepted into the new needs-based program, Mr. Speaker, and we'll be working with those children and their families over the next uh, month or so before expanding uh, to uh, a far greater number of, of children across the province. But I think it's really important to add that uh, when we made this announcement uh, earlier this spring or, or back in the winter, uh, Mr. Speaker, we, we talked about the fact that we've invested twice the amount of money that was in the previous program from the Liberal government, $300 million more Spons? than the grand total of $600 million, Mr. Speaker. We'll be spending that, and every child in the province is continuing to receive funding from the government. Uh, that's far more than the pitiful numbers from the previous Liberal government when they were in charge. Mr. And the supplementary question. Speaker, well, I appreciate the response that hasn't really answered the questions that, I, that the families are actually looking answers to, so I'll ask again. For years, uh, for, year, for over two years, these kids have been waiting for service. For over two years, these families have been given no information, no stable funding, no program. In fact, under this government, capacity has decreased. Kids have been denied much-needed therapies, and families have been forced to go further into debt to support their kids. Families tell me that the lack of transparency and the blind disregard for the information that they need is unconscionable. Will the minister finally answer the, these parents' valid questions and confirm whether clinicians have the final say, that there will be appeals process, what the criteria was used to invite families into the OAP pilot program, what are the success markers Question. for the program? Minister, please be clear and, and give the parents the respect they deserve and answer the questions that I asked your ministry. Mr. Uh, Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to answer uh, some of these questions. I can, I can confirm that more than 34,000 families are receiving support through their existing behaviour plans, Mr. Speaker, uh, childhood budgets and interim one-time funding as we continue to implement the new needs-based program. For those families, Mr. Speaker, uh, they have been assessed by a care coordinator, Mr. Speaker, and clinicians are going to be working with those families all the way through the process, Mr. Speaker. That's why we've started with 600 families in this Ontario Autism Program needs-based program, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we get this right before expanding the program. Mr. Speaker, I don't have to tell anyone in this legislature that mistakes have been made on this file dating back to the early 2000s, Mr. Speaker. We've taken the time to work with clinicians, researchers, experts, family members, Response. those with lived experience to get this right once and for all. We're on our way, Mr. Speaker. We are going to have the best program in the entire country. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Essential workers in retail are now eligible for vaccines if they're 18 or older, but some important people were excluded from this group. Many tr workers in the retail sector, especially in supermarkets, are adolescents aged 16 or 17. I have a 16-year-old daughter who works in a hot zone in a supermarket, and she says that the other cashiers are her age. Jean-Francois, a parent of five children in Toronto, contacted me telling me that his entire family got COVID. 
His 16-year-old daughter also works in a supermarket. Mr. Speaker, these people are essential workers, just like everyone else, but they're still not prioritized for vaccination. Here is my question. What should I tell all these adolescents that need to deal with frustrated clients but that continue to work and serve us? Thank you. Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you for the question. We do have a vaccine rollout plan that is divided into three phases. We are into phase two right now, and we are looking at the first essential workers group, people that are not able to work from home. And there are many people that fall into this category. We are now getting into the category of people that are doing work like grocery store clerks, frontline clerks, people that are doing customer service. All of those issues are, are being taken into consideration. And we want to make sure that we can continue with this rollout. We now can vaccinate 12 to 17-year-olds, as you're aware. This is starting uh, via our booking agency as of May 31st, but people can still go and make appointments to, uh, to be vaccinated otherwise. So this is something that we want to make sure that everyone in Ontario that wants to receive a vaccine will be able to receive a vaccine, and we are working through a list of essential workers now. And the supplementary question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My supplementals for uh, the Minister of Health. There's been a lot of talk about uh, frontline workers this past year, Mr. Speaker, how important they are, how undervalued and underappreciated they are, and the pandemic has opened our eyes to the valuable and essential role they play in our communities. What seems to have gone unnoticed, Mr. Speaker, is the critical role that teenagers play in this workforce. Students who pour the Premier's coffee in the morning and make his real egg sandwich at Tim Hortons need and deserve to be vaccinated. And yet the coffee and the sandwich, Mr. Speaker, have received more of the Premier's attention than these critical workers. The students in Orleans that are stocking shelves at the grocery store that are pouring coffee at Tim Hortons or working at a pharmacy deserve and need to be prioritized for vaccinations, Mr. Speaker. We would have thought the government would have done it when the vaccines were authorized uh, for children uh, most recently, Mr. Speaker. That hasn't happened. So my question to the minister is, when are teenagers who work in the front lines, who are pouring coffee and, and stocking shelves, working in grocery stores, going to be prioritized for vaccines? Mr. Paul. They have been prioritized for vaccines. We've already made the vaccines available. The Pfizer vaccines will be available for 12 to 17-year-olds, including the teenagers that you're speaking about. They are not able to work from home, obviously. They will be able to book their appointments online versus via our booking tool as of May 31st, and they can still receive those vaccines if they book through a pharmacy. So we are, we are prioritizing them. We know that they are not able to work from home, so we're prioritizing both that group of workers as well well as those young people. Next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the government's plan to use COVID-19 as a cover to make remote learning permanent in Ontario has communities reeling. The Waterloo Region District School Board wrote to the Minister of Education regarding the proposed changes, and I quote, the letter requests that he halt the implementation of this TVO-TFO-based ind independent learning proposal until further research is completed and all key stakeholders are consulted. And school boards aren't alone. Andrea Brown, a Waterloo Region uh, parent of two, wrote to the MPP of Waterloo, and I quote, We still don't understand the full impacts of the pandemic on our kids. After a year of uncertainty and disrupted learning, the last thing our kids need is a backdoor move to permanently cut funding for in-person learning. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. Can the Premier guarantee that funding for in-person learning will not be affected for September? Mr. Education. What the government can guarantee is that every parent in Ontario will have a choice of in-class and online learning, a choice that would be denied if the members opposite had their way. And I think it's important that we appreciate this pandemic while we all look forward to a world with vaccines that will reduce risk, we believe parents are best positioned to make the decision for their child, recognizing overwhelmingly most kids will be in school, and that is a good thing for their development and their mental health. Mr. Speaker, we put, in, uh, we put a plan in place, $1.6 billion of investment, to protect in-class learning to protect public education in this province more than any province in this country, following the best advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, 
$200 million additional dollars for remote learning to strengthen that capacity. There is literally over 150,000 more tablets provided to families, over 10,000 internet connections. We've expanded professional development to make the online learning, remote learning experience better for families, for children, and for educators themselves. We've done this all in spite of the opposition by, uh, by the New Bonds. Democrats, Liberals, and teacher unions, because we believe at the end of the day, it's critical children continue to learn irrespective of the challenges we face at home and abroad. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. Without real investments in public education, diverse learners and their families will suffer. One of Andrea's children is in the pre-IB program, and her oldest child, who is on the autism spectrum, has severe anxiety. She insists that the impact of remote learning must be better understood, and I quote, for both of my children, the quality of their education is dramatically reduced. Mr. Speaker, like Andrea, the WRDSB trustees are demanding that government decisions be based on research. They write, and I quote, we are concerned with the lack of research showing that this proposal will improve student achievement and well-being. And they raise that, and I quote, their empathetic objection to the rushed and radical changes to remote learning being proposed by the ministry. As my daddy always says, Hurry brings worry, and worry wears you out. Question. So my question through to you, to the Premier, will the government commit to assessing the impact of remote learning during the pandemic and halt all steps to make this permanent in Ontario? Mr. Education. What is a radical concept, in my estimation, is the, con is the idea that a politician would know better than a mother or father in this, in this province. And I find that very offensive for parents in Ontario that want to retain the choice of in-class and online learning. We believe in providing that choice. We believe in funding them, delivering them through public education, and we also believe that our online learning system has improved over time because we've made the requisite investments to ensure it is there when we need it. For a snow day in this province all the way to a global pandemic, this province uniquely is ready to keep our kids learning, which is critical for their development and, of course, for their own mental health. Mr. Speaker, we provided in our budget an additional enhancement in, in our remote Spons? learning system, but at the end of the day, Speaker, our priority remains on keeping our in-class learning safe. It's why we've invested $1.6 billion for more staffing, for enhanced cleaning, the maintenance of public health nurses, and testing to ensure kids and staff are safe in this property. Next question, the member for York Center. Thank you, Speaker, to the Minister of Health. On January 15, I warned the Premier and the public that lockdown is deadlier than COVID. I cited public health that opioid overdose was trending 50 percent higher. I was accused of misinformation and removed from caucus. This week, the final numbers came in. Fatal overdose rose 75 percent in Ontario from March to December 2020, compared to the same period in 2019. Almost double the people aged 25 to 44 lost their lives, an increase of 501. Compare that to a total of 159 people who lost their life to COVID between the ages 20 to 50. Every loss of life is tragic, Speaker, so we should try and save it. The increase in deaths from overdose alone is more than triple compared to all deaths from COVID ages 20 to 50, and that's just overdose. At suicides, delayed surgeries and cancer screenings, the death of these young people are on this government. I've been warning them about this for a year now. So I asked the minister to turn off the answer machine, show compassion, and before more people die from everything but COVID, Question. tell us if she'll end the lockdown. Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker. Well, there's a lot to do. Say that uh, I am aware that the report came out. I'm very grateful to Dr. Heyer and his team and the other individuals that uh, put this report together. We take this very seriously, and that is why we are, are working with them on their recommendations, uh, which make eminent sense. However, with respect to the lockdown, <clears throat> that we entered into the lockdown because of these variants of concern that have caused very high transmission in our communities that are also threatening the lives of many, many people. That's why we had to implement the lockdown to save those lives. That's the whole purpose of it. Any life lost is tragic. Uh, but we need to continue with this until the time is right, until the levels are down lower, before we can start exiting this lockdown, because, Response. again, the goal remains the same. The health and well-being of the people of Ontario are our, uh, is our utmost priority and will continue to be. Supplementary. Speaker, I don't understand. We all want to save lives. The argument is, is that 
our measures are taking more lives than they're saving. The evidence is in. I'll buy every member here a copy of the star which outlines the numbers. Ontario, ages 20 to 50, the increase, the delta of people dying from overdose is triple the number of people dying from COVID. Enough with this COVID political theater already. All life is life and all life is precious. And these members, these ministers, they know their policy is resulting in more harm and more lives lost than saved. They ran to serve the people, not harm them. The delayed surgeries and the million canceled cancer screenings alone will render the human toll of their fear mongering and lockdown multiple times deadlier than COVID could ever be. And this goes for the NDP and the Liberals as well. Why do we keep pretending when the evidence is in front of you? Speaker, I'm asking the minister, as a colleague, a mother, a human being, will she please end this human catastrophe? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, any life lost is a tragedy, and we know that over 4,000 people have died from COVID-19 in, in Ontario, and there have been losses due to the opioid crisis as well. We're, that's why we have been working on it. That's why we have since before this pandemic even started. We started with a consumption and treatment services sites. There are uh, 16 that have already been approved, and we're still receiving applications from communities. We're also working through our uh, roadmap to wellness, our mental health and addictions plan that came out just before this uh, pandemic struck to make sure that we're going to invest $3.8 billion over 10 years in our mental health and addiction system. It's vitally important. We are, have to deal with the mental health system. We put $175 million extra into the system last year, $176 million this year, and we'll continue to do that to protect people to from the opioids crisis, but also to help them with their mental health issues. This is something that is going to last longer than the pandemic will last, and we're prepared to help the people of Ontario through all of their crises and with these issues. Member for York Centre, come to order. That concludes question period for today.